The nations of Indonesia and Malaysia, two important countries strategically located within the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, are emerging to play as key partners in the coming economic decades of Asia. The Indonesia-Malaysia bilateral relationship is among the most beneficial to this economic partnership, mainly because of the geography that the two share, making transportation of goods and services far lower than what is to trade elsewhere. Hence, the Malaysia-Indonesia bilateral trade was, in 2021, rising exponentially, with the first eight months of the year recording a total of about 13.4 billion US dollars, an almost 50% increase year over year. But there are even goals to push their total annual trade to over $30 billion by 2025, a rather more bold and ambitious move, as this would boost Malaysia's already huge $500 billion or so trade economy. Furthermore, Indonesia and Malaysia are also strategically located within a number of growth triangles, a known factor that helped boost the two nations' exports and the overall economy. These known partnership agreements are the likes of the Sujori Growth Triangle, which combines the two nations and Singapore, and the IMTGT, which includes Thailand. These treaties have helped push a newfound relationship and created tens of thousands to even hundreds of thousands of jobs as these treaties have contributed billions of dollars worth of projects, trade, and investments. These have then helped the two nations to continuously contribute billions of dollars of foreign direct investments to each other, with Malaysia paving the way for over billions of dollars every quarter into Indonesia, at one point registering over $12.5 billion. Despite all these grand schemes, the Malaysian-Indonesia bilateral relationship was not actually all that bright during the past century or so. This was because of several conflicts and confrontations that have happened in the past. The past, which was never forgotten, had brought numerous problems even in modern history. To understand all these, we must first go back to the intertwining history of Indonesia and Malaysia. Throughout the two nations' well-documented past, the two nations had experienced a number of empires and kingdoms that at times had Indonesia's land and Malaysia's land together. Some of these are previously known as the Brunei Sultanate, which ruled in the 15th century, the Johar Sultanate, which lasted approximately 400 years, and even one that dates back in the 7th century, known as Srivijaya, which at that time ruled major parts of Malaysia and Indonesia. This profound history was a key in the two nations' intertwining history, but as the 20th century hits, painful history was brought in. Just a few years after the official diplomatic relations were signed in 1957, the relations quickly deteriorated. In 1962, the three-year-long armed conflict, known as the Borneo Confrontation, occurred. This brought Malaysia and several Commonwealth nations to go up against Indonesia, which was backed by China and the Soviet Union. This hostility has seen over a thousand people killed. Thankfully, a resolution was met and the unnecessary conflict ended. With the rise of Suharto, the relations between the two had gone up significantly since the fall of Sukarno. This earmarked the beginning of a long grand history, which started exactly on June 1, 1966, after the signing of the Bangkok Accord, which was followed by the Jakarta Accord on the 11th of August 1966. A year later, ASEAN was founded and was the great successor to what would alleviate all the military threats and embark on a long journey of economic growth. Today, however, there are still groups around the two nations that still harbor distrust and disagreements between the two. Some of these are even being sparked all the way through the government themselves. But long gone are the need for military and weapon reuses and all that is being done is through accusations or through past controversies which were at times led by anti-Malaysians or anti-Indonesians, with one infamous incident known as the 2009 Pendant Controversy, which saw the burning of Malaysian flags done by groups of associations from Indonesia and even saw the emergence of a possible conflict. The investment landscape between the two is amongst the best foreign economic drivers across Southeast Asia, or even arguably across the entire continent itself. This is because of the previously mentioned 
mentioned treaties such as the Singapore-Indonesia-Malaysia Growth Triangle known as the IMSGT and the IMGT which includes Thailand. This has paved the way for a seamless business-to-business -business connectivity, which by some is seen as a great way to enhance and harbor connections. The IMSGT, which was established in 1994, helped link Singapore with its natural and labor-intensive resources to what is today known as the island of Batam, owned by Indonesia, and the Iskandar Development Region, owned by Malaysia. This has especially helped the island of Batam, as it grows from a measly small six 6,000 population to more than a million. The IMTGT, on the other hand, had worked out so well that the three nations' goals became so aligned that the payment of numerous economic corridors, visions, and billions of dollars worth of investments and trade had been successful. Since its inception of this in 1993, the subregion of IMT had implemented the so-called Vision 2036, a framework that came out in 2014 to increase real GDP to to $694 billion and per capita to $32,120, up from $13,844 in 2015. Further, we will also see the subregion's trade increase to 28%, up from only 9.2% in 2015. And lastly, see over 4,000 cross-border projects directed by the local corporations. How this will all happen will likely be impacted by the subregion's physical connectivity project, which is an initiative that aims to build roads, railways, bridges, airports, seaports, and so on to continuously help ease troubles of connectivity with one another. Other. The two nations specifically, with other treaties aside, have also done so well throughout the past two decades. From 2008 to 2016, Malaysia has contributed over $15 billion in investments, while in the same time frame, Indonesia had around $2.6 billion. It is even argued by a lot that this foreign investment coming from Malaysia to Indonesia is just going to grow exponentially over the coming years. This is being led by Indonesia's upper rising potential, which is being seen around the world as a crucial place for investment. With Malaysia's connections and strategic geography, it is inherent that they will be among the first to take such a chance. Among the largest was related to a $3.1 billion for memoranda of understanding across private companies in Malaysia to Indonesia, which will bring government-linked companies such as Kazana National, Perbadana National, and the Employee Provident Fund to find opportunities around Indonesia, with privately owned venture capital also seeking more opportunities themselves, firms such as Malaysia-based Gobi Partners, Game Founders, and 1,337 Ventures have helped fund Indonesian local startups. Even Indonesia's new capital in Nusantara is being explored greatly by Malaysian companies. It is even argued that Malaysia will experience a spillover effect from Indonesia's new emerging capital city. While not an entirely huge boost, it will still impact the Malaysian states that are nearby Nusantara. As some have indicated, it is going to be a lot of work led by the push for the new capital city's need for clean energy, something that Malaysia offers a lot. With SoftBank pulling out of Indonesia's new capital, it is important to also indicate that Indonesia is going to be more aggressive as it looks for alternative investors. With Malaysia standing to benefit a lot, not just from capital allocation and earning interests or other forms of appreciation, it is going to see a brighter opportunity with this one. And despite the historical conflicts, Indonesia and Malaysia have also found footing and agreements on several treaties that helped shape a number of of military alliances. Some of these have helped shape regional peace between maritime and air boundaries, some that even extend further as the need for more regional peace and the threat from outside forces continues to rise. The culture, on the other hand, is also seen as having shared and numerous similarities, as Indonesian migrants known as Indonesian Malaysians have found the country of Malaysia as their home throughout the past. Three kings and six prime ministers of Malaysia are well documented to have Indonesian heritage.
Regardless of all the issues and problems in the past, these are likely decreasing already. From the looks of it, because of the emergence of the internet, we are now seeing more connections, personal and business, between the population of Malaysia and Indonesia. This might be why there are strong calls for more connections between the two, as the future is looking to join the two nations' economies better. But that is, likely, going to only be possible as long as we continue to trust and lean on each other and put the historical conflicts in the past. We are sure that this is going to happen and is already happening. Well, only time will quite frankly tell.